It's an encore presentation of osteobites you might really like to hear. It's with Dr. Kurt Weiss, an osteosarcoma survivor, physician, and researcher who is our 2021 Outsmarting Osteosarcoma grant winner. This is a really good one. Thanks for listening. Osteobites is a weekly osteosarcoma webinar and podcast presented by MIB agents. Today, we're talking about a day in the life of a musculoskeletal oncologist with Dr. Kurt Weiss, Associate Professor, University of Pittsburgh, Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Division of Musculoskeletal Oncology. Our panelists are MIB agent, junior board members, and osteo-warriors, Maeve Smart and Ryan Kennington. I'm your host, Ann Graham. Welcome to Osteobites, everyone, where my bite today is a bowl of very healthy nuts and seeds disguised with um, chocolate so that they're much more edible that way, <laughs> um, but they are delicious. Uh, we have a first on Osteobites today, which I'm super excited about. Dr. Kurt Weiss is our guest. Dr. Weiss is an associate professor in the University of Pittsburgh Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Division of Mus Musculoskeletal Oncology. He was diagnosed with metastatic osteosarcoma at age 15 and attributes his survival to participation in a phase two clinical trial, something we like to talk about on osteobites. So really interested to hear about that. Um, he is talking with us today about a day in the life of a musculoskeletal oncologist, margins, metal, munchkins, and other meandering madness. Thanks for that complicated title, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Our Osteo Warrior panel includes MIB Agents Junior Board Member Maeve Smart and MIB Agents Junior Board Member Ryan Kennington. Maeve and Ryan are both pursuing a career in medicine. And uh, I'm also an Osteo Warrior and your host, Ann Graham. I'm the president of MIB Agents. MIB Agents makes it better, MIB, for kids with osteosarcoma. We help kids facing this aggressive cancer by providing direct patient and family support and educational programs. If you're on this webinar, you know that osteosarcoma is the oldest known cancer with some of the oldest known treatments. So we also support the researcher and physician community in an annual conference through Osteobites and by funding meaningful osteosarcoma specific research. A mission of this size desires the hearts and hands of many, so we welcome your participation to make it better. Dr. Weiss, would you get us started by introducing yourself, please? Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Kurt Weiss coming to you from my very luxurious office at uh, the University of Pittsburgh, and I'm going to talk plenty, so uh, probably too much to suit you. So let's hear from uh, Maeve and Ryan, and then I'll get going. Hi everyone, my name is Maeve. I'm a two-time osteosarcoma survivor and I was diagnosed in 2011 and 2014. I'm now six years no evidence of disease, um, a fourth year student at Northeastern University in Boston, and as Anne mentioned, a member of the MIB Junior Board. I have some almonds today as my osteobite snack and I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Hi, my name is Ryan. <laughs> uh, I was diagnosed with osteosarcoma back in 2014 when I was 17 years old and my right had my right femur. I had a limb salvaging surgery. Uh, a year later, after I finished treatment, I had a relapse in my lung and I had bats to get that removed. And ever since, uh, I've been cancer free. Uh, so recently, I just graduated from the University of Delaware with a degree in biology and I'm excited to be here. All right. Well, we're excited too, Ryan. Um, you guys are amazing. Um, you know, there, there aren't a bajillion metastatic osteosarcoma survivors around. I'm honored to, uh, to be able to talk with you today. Again, thank you for asking me to join you today. I am new to the MIB universe, but very, very, very excited uh, to be here uh, with Anne and with everybody. Um, again, my name's Kurt. I'm at the University of Pittsburgh, where I am a uh, orthopedic oncology surgeon scientist. Um, I help to direct the musculoskeletal oncology lab and I'm our vice chair of translational research. I have no financial disclosures. Um, all my other disclosures are uh, to my priest father Tim, to my therapist Larry, and I will not be discussing those. Uh, maybe a little bit, but not much. 
And um, this will be indeed meandering. And the reason for that disclosure is because uh, I operated all day Monday. I was uh, in clinic on Tuesday and I have two grants going out today. Uh, so sleep has not been high on the priority list this week. Um, so you are really not seeing me at my best. But uh, you know, for these young aspiring physicians here, uh, you know, this is the life. So uh, this this is what you're getting into. So uh, you may as well see it in all its authentic awesomeness. Uh, a little bit about my background. Sometimes you choose the job, and sometimes it chooses you. Uh, I was diagnosed with metastatic osteosarcoma when I was 15 years old in uh, 1989, and uh, uh, talk about that a little bit, and uh, now I'm on faculty uh, uh, in Pittsburgh, where I was born and raised. So, uh, swings and roundabouts, as the Scots say. Uh, so, if you take a kid and you give him a horrible metastatic bone tumor, and you expose him to these mentors in surgery, Henry Mankin, Mark Goodman, Richard McGow, you might get yourself a musculoskeletal oncology surgeon. It's kind of like a mathematical equation. You take the same kid and give him the same rotten tumor and expose him to these mentors in science, Chris Evans, uh, who's at the Mayo Clinic, Jeannie Kleinerman, who's at uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center. I'm gonna talk a lot about her. And uh, Lee Hellman, who of course was, I think, must've been one of your first osteobite speaker. Um, uh, you might get yourself a musculoskeletal oncology translational scientist. Uh, so let's, let's throw in some more M's. Uh, this is Memories of Mankin. Now, Henry Mankin is a guy who was at Harvard for uh, a million years. He's actually born and raised in Pittsburgh. And um, Henry is, uh, was an orthopedic oncologist and for sure uh, was perhaps the greatest orthopedic surgeon scientist of the last century. Uh, that's him in the middle there and, and my mom on the right and, and me on the left and about my senior year of high school. And um, uh, Henry was keeping databases before the word database existed and was one of the first uh, serious chondrocytes, that's cartilage biology uh, scientists. And uh, he was so proud when I, when I got into residency at the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, that's him and I in 2004 on the, the right panel there. And Henry went to heaven about a year and a half ago. Um, and I uh, sure miss him. I loved him very much. And uh, yeah, this is Dr. Kleinerman. This is Dr. Eugenia Kleinerman, um, who invented the experimental therapy that saved my life. And one of the greatest highlights of uh, my, my, my entire lifetime was working in her lab uh, during medical school, elbow to elbow with the same scientific team that devised the treatment that saved my life. And if you don't think that was cool, um, it, it was it was wonderful. And she and this the right panel there is uh, me and Jeannie and her husband Leonard at a uh, uh, sarcoma meeting in Tokyo. And uh, she really is my scientific mom and my most important mentor. Uh, she's the first person I call when I get a paper accepted. Uh, she's the first person I call when I get a grant rejected. Um, and uh, I, I just love her to death. Um, just as a brief aside, you know, um, everybody's talking about immunotherapy these days. It's the new hotness. Jeannie Kleinerman was talking about uh, immunotherapy for osteosarcoma 30 years ago. She is the grand dame of sarcoma immunology. and um, if she has uh, one fault, it's that she was vastly ahead of her time. She's absolutely brilliant. And if I can make this shameless plug, if you want a great MIB speaker, boy, you should give her a call. She's really something else. I, I, and I love her very much. She was, okay. one, of our, she was one of our first speakers at uh, our first Factor Conference. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Well, you made a great choice then because she's amazing. Well, I mean, we thought, heck, we might be onto something if we get Dr. Kleinerman here to speak. That's, this is amazing. We're honored Indeed. to have her. Indeed. So, so what the heck am I going to talk about? I mean, look at the, so now I've just heard that you have the person I look up to probably the most in the whole world and my scientific mom, you had her as a speaker. Um, I worked in Lee, in Lee Hellman's lab for a year uh, during medical school 
and he taught me everything I know, but unfortunately not everything he knows. Just a brilliant, brilliant dude who has donated his uh, entire life to the research and treatment of young people with sarcomas and uh, a wonderful guy and a brilliant guy. And uh, a few weeks ago, you had Matteo Trucco talk and he spoke about the um, uh, copper disulfiram uh, treatment for metastatic osteosarcoma. And I want you guys to think I'm a real life scientist. So I included uh, my, some of my papers on this topic that, that is what spurred Matteo to, to chase this down. And uh, you also had John Healy talk a few weeks ago. And uh, boy, uh, if, there, if there's anyone who's a model for me as a surgeon scientist, it's John Healy. I mean, minus the bow tie, he's everything I want to be. He's a, a fearless surgeon, brilliant scientist, um, puts his family first. He's, he's just terrific by, by every metric. So you know, what am I going to talk about? Well, they, they tell you to, in, in, uh, in writing, they tell you to write what you know. So I'm just going to talk about what I know, which is what my life is like uh, on any given day. So historically, uh, this is what an academic physician was supposed to be, somebody that could do patient care in the morning and lecture the medical students or the residents at noon and uh, go into your lab in the afternoon. Okay, so can we do that in this day and age with um, healthcare being so expensive and a lot of people don't even have health insurance and this alphabet soup of, of new metrics and regulations and uh, you know all these things and at least in Pennsylvania it seems like um, every time you turn around, there's, there's a, a lawyer waiting to call you stupid. Um, so is there room for and value on research and, and teaching, especially in a disease like osteosarcoma that, that is on the rare side? Or has the triple threat gone the way of old T-Rex and the California condor? Well, I certainly hope not. I think we can all agree that the purpose of research is to improve the quality of life. And scientists are brilliant, obviously, but they, they don't look after patients. So they don't always have a complete understanding of what are number one, two, and three on our lists of concerns when we're addressing a patient with a serious problem. And physicians, as wonderful as they are, especially the surgeons, just ask us, we'll tell you, um, don't always have a tremendous grasp of science. So when I think about translational research, I take that very literally. Uh, I think that uh, there is a real need for people who understand the language of the clinic and understand the language of uh, the laboratory to get those two groups to communicate uh, to their greatest potentials. Uh, when I was at uh, the University of Toronto doing my fellowship, a wonderful surgeon scientist named Rebe Rebecca Gladdy told me, you know, nobody's going to be happy with you as a surgeon scientist. Your, your surgical partners are going to tell you you need to operate more, you need to be seeing more patients, you need to be generating more revenue for the health system, da 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 da. Your scientific partners are going to say, hey, we need to see more of you in the lab, you need to write more papers, you need to get more grants. You're just going to learn how to be happy with yourself because no one else is going to be happy with you. Uh, so what gets me up in the morning? This is what gets me up in the morning. Uh, in the right picture is me and my patient, Katie, who is uh, just about, spoiler alert, is just about to start her sophomore year of uh, undergraduate. But I diagnosed her with osteosarcoma of the right proximal tibia, same location as mine, uh, in 2015. Her prognosis was the same as mine when I was diagnosed in 1989. And this gets to what, what Anne was talking about earlier with some of the oldest treatments. Is there anybody in the universe who thinks that that's okay? I certainly hope not, because it's not okay. Uh, it, it's not acceptable, and we need to find a better way of looking after osteosarcoma. All right, now let's take a sharp turn and talk about surgery. This is a, a t-shirt that my daughter got for me, and you probably can't see the writing, but it says, it's not rocket surgery, which is uh, one of my favorite mixed metaphors of all time. 
Uh, so let's talk about some surgery that is admittedly not rocket surgery. First, I want to talk about the guiding principle of osteosarcoma surgery, and that's the concept of margins. And this is an analogy I have stolen from my teachers at the University of Toronto. If we think of the sarcoma as an orange, the osteosarcoma is the, the fruit, the part of the orange that we eat. Now, if I go in there with my melon baller and I scoop out all the tumor that I see and I'm as meticulous as I can be and I take my time and I uh, do the best job I think I can do, I will leave osteosarcoma cells there, million percent. So, uh, so what's a surgeon to do? How do you take the tumor out and make sure that you got the whole thing. Well, you put a peel on it, like an orange has. And this is what we call the wide margin. So that is that you put normal Anne or Maeve or Ryan in 360 degrees in three dimensions all the way around the tumor, like a peel or like insulation, right? So when we do these operations, do we do some intentional collateral damage? The answer is yes. Do we feel bad about that? Of course we do. But do we apologize for it? We really don't. Because that's the best way we know in 2020 that we're going to get all of the tumor out. Okay? So here's example one, uh, distal femur. This is the most common site for osteosarcoma. And uh, this patient was 23 years old when I met her. So she had this sort of not terrible looking abnormality in her a distal femur. This is her knee joint here. And I didn't think it looked too terrible, but it looked terrible enough that I wanted to get a biopsy. So I did that. And unfortunately, it showed a high-grade osteosarcoma. I was, I was a bit surprised. So she got her chemotherapy, just like we all got. And now it's time to do her surgery. So as the orthopedic oncologist, the question I need to ask and answer is, what has to go? What do I need to remove in order to achieve that, that wide negative margin? And these are lines that I draw in my brain uh, when I'm looking at the scans, when I'm looking at the x-ray, and now when I'm looking at the MRI scan. Uh, Maeve and Ryan, you guys are, are going into medicine. Uh, what do you suppose that line is there? Um, potentially a biopsy? Million percent. Gold star, Maeve. So that's... <laughs> That's where we did the biopsy. So you see, I have this circled out. Every cell must go, okay? This is an every cell must go sale. So that, I have to consider that when I did that biopsy, I contaminated that whole tract with osteosarcoma cells and they gotta go. So keep your eye on that skin paddle. Um, now I'm gonna show some, some intraoperative pictures. So if any of you out there are squeamish, Now's the time to um, put something over your screen or look away. And keep your eye on that paddle of skin, because there it is. And it's connected onto the tumor all the way down. Um, and that is our wide margin. OK, so uh, now I've taken out the tumor with that wide margin all the way around it. And it's time to put her back together again. And I have this system, this modular set of uh, of, of parts that I can rebuild the femur of just about anybody of any size uh, from parts on the back table. So this is really the way we do it. So we'll take the, the specimen and we'll build something that looks to be about the same size and shape. Think of it as advanced Legos. And then we'll trial it in the patient. If we like the way it moves and the way it feels, we will take out the trials and put in the components and there we have it. That's what her x-rays look like. This is what we call a distal femur replacement, or DFR. And how do, well do those hold up? Well, this uh, young lady works as a chef, and she's on her feet all day, six days out of the week, and it was good enough for her to do her job and good enough for her to walk down the aisle. So uh, for her, it works pretty good. And she um, uh, remains disease-free. Here's example number two in the distal or bottom end of the humerus. And we can see the very destructive bone tumor here and there on the other view. 
These are the lines I draw in my brain. And this is what the specimen looks like after we take it out of the patient. It goes down to our friends in pathology uh, for them to slice and dice it. And this is how we rebuild her with this uh, total elbow and distal humerus replacement. And this doesn't look like much, but I'll tell you, um, the function and the motion that these patients get is superb. Um, these really, really work well. Okay, so a, another quiz for, for Maeve and Ryan. This is a knee x-ray of a young person, I'm giving it away a little bit, of a young person, uh, and this is their knee x-ray. So you see these scalloped lines here? What are they? Whoever, whoever from the audience answered growth plate is, is also getting a gold star. That's a million percent correct. So our problem is, one of our many problems, is that we know osteosarcoma likes to happen in the skeletons of people that are not done growing. What do you do when you're dealing with a sarcoma in a bone that ain't done growing? Well, one of the ways you can skin that cat is by putting in an implant that grows. And I will explain what that means with an example. Here's uh, uh, my buddy, one of my very favorite patients who had some pain after a soccer game. And uh, he came in with this uh, very badly destructive uh, bone tumor in his distal femur. And it stops right about there. And you can tell that you we're gonna have to take this growth plate out right there. That's going to have to go. That's part of our wide margin. So this is what we did for him. Uh, and, and again, this is not what you have to do. This is what I did. There are many different ways to skin a cat. And, but his, his bone isn't growing yet. He's, he's seven years old. So what, what are we going to do about that? Well, the idea of an expandable megaprosthesis is not new. But you used to have to take these kids to the operating room and make another incision and put an Allen wrench in their prosthesis and kind of crank it open to, to lengthen it. Well, it's another trip to the operating room. It's another anesthesia. It's you know another risk of infection. That isn't so great. So our, our friends in engineering, and the, the engineers are really wonderful, developed a way that we could do this non-invasively. How we do this is when, when my buddy comes in to get lengthened, his leg goes in this, this purple donut that is like a mini MRI scanner. And when you flick the thing on, an electromagnetic field is produced that activates gears inside the prosthesis that cause it to expand open like a telescope. Okay, It expands very slowly at a rate of one millimeter every four minutes. So my, my guy doesn't no or care what's going on. He hangs out and plays his game, and he just knows that after 20 minutes has gone by, he's five millimeters longer. And this is what that looks like with the x-ray. So we'll do some glamour shots here. That's when I put it in, and that's what it looks like now. And uh, we will expand him until uh, uh, his other leg says he's done growing. And I can tell you, uh, this kid does not take it easy on this prosthesis. Um, he beats the heck out of this thing, and it is serving him very well. Okay, amputation. This is something I know a little bit of about. I was just knocking on my leg. I started out with a um, limb salvage, and uh, eventually, because a number of, uh, of a number of different uh, complications, I had to get an amputation. Most of the time, we're able to uh, spare the limb, but not always. Uh, and sometimes amputation is inevitable. Sometimes it's sooner, sometimes it's later, but uh, sometimes you just can't get around it. And sometimes people do pretty well. And this is a clinical picture of a guy named Udo who is a German bus driver. And why that's important, I'll get back to in a minute. Modern uh, prosthetic sockets, people can do some pretty amazing things. Uh, this is me hiking the West Rim of the Grand Canyon. Uh, in 1996, and there's a Paralympic athlete. But can we do better? These are all the problems that can occur with sockets, which is where the prosthesis meets the person. And I've had all these problems and more. And what it comes down to is 100% of my problems are socket problems. I can't take a day off. That is not okay. Uh, I, got, I got patients that count on me. 
I, I, I've got experiments that need to be done. Taking a day off because my leg hurts is not an option. Uh, so these, these can be big problems. What if we could make a prosthesis that didn't have a socket? And the inspiration comes from nature and from our friends in dentistry. This bull elk doesn't need any sockets to keep the antlers attached to his head. And dentists have been putting implants right into the bone that stick out of the bone in, the, in a fairly dirty environment of your mouth for decades and getting away with it. So if they can get away with it, why can't we get away with it? This is where osseo integration uh, came about. And this is a device that um, attaches directly to your bone and by definition traverses uh, the skin and connects with the outside world. So we're talking about direct endoskeletal attachment. And this is what it looks like in a cartoon. That's what the x-ray looks like. Now, now putting pieces of metal that grow into bone is not a new thing for us. This is something that orthopedic surgeons have been doing for decades. This, I, I mean, I just did this myself on Monday. Uh, now back to Udo, the German bus driver. He has difficulty sitting for a long period of time. And every couple minutes, he has to get up and walk around the bus to, to shake it out and make his leg feel better. Well, that's not good because Germans don't care for being late. And Udo was going to lose his job if he didn't figure something out. This was a real life issue for him. And this is Udo today. He has a prosthesis that has direct endo endoskeletal attachment and traverses that skin barrier to connect with the outside world. People walk pretty good with these things. This is a, a video from one of our colleagues over in Europe. And this is a patient of my former partner, Dr. Mark Goodman. This guy had a uh, transfemoral or above the knee amputation, and he was confined to a wheelchair. And um, he, he was a big guy, he couldn't do anything, and was pretty miserable. So not having any other good options, Dr. Goodman said, you know, geez, why don't we give this a try? Now, and this is Dr. Mark Goodman. Uh, this is another wonderful of uh, mentors, then again, another M. Uh, Dr. Goodman did about 25 operations on me. And much like getting to work in Dr. Kleinerman's lab, for about nine years, I got to have my doctor as my senior partner. And if you don't think that was the coolest thing ever, getting to operate side by side with my surgeon, I, I don't know what the rest of my career has in store for me, but nothing is gonna be that special. But here's Dr. Goodman's patient. Now he doesn't walk perfectly, but he's not using any walkers. He sure isn't in a wheelchair. His biggest complaint, he said, Dr. Goodman, I don't know what to do with my hand. I'm, I'm, I'm used to using crutches or a walker all the time or a wheelchair. You know, I, I got these hands. I don't know what to do with them. So uh, I think that means we're doing something pretty good. This is another patient of uh, another one of my partners, Dr. Richard McGow, who's the uh, chief of our musculoskeletal oncology division. This is a 60-year-old guy who had a sarcoma in his left arm. And uh, eventually his arm became so painful that he begged Dr. McGow to do an amputation on him. And this is his arm today. Now, get ready for this because this is some cool stuff. All right. uh, this is brought to you uh, by my partner, Dr. McGow, and also our friends down at Duke, who built this guy a pretty cool arm. This is a myoelectric arm that uh, he controls with what's left of his nerve and with his brain. So this is a one of a kind on planet Earth. And it's just amazing. And I'm told that this guy has gotten so good at this that he can now control individual fingers of that hand. So he can point to things, he can press buttons, he can let people know he's upset when he's on the highway, he can do all those things. Uh, as we get to the end of my meanderings, what have I learned thus far? I'm a pretty lucky guy. Uh, I, a lot of things had to go right for me to survive. Mostly end up in the clinic of a real smart lady uh, down at MD Anderson Cancer Center who saved my life. Um, everything I've been through matters. And what do I mean by that? Diagnosis, surgery, 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 surgery times 30. Uh, 
complications, metastasis, recurrence, infection, uh, amputation, all these things color the way I deal with my patients. It does not make me better. It just makes me different. And, and all these things matter and, and affect the way I interact with patients and families. This is something very important, but if you remember one thing from today, this, this would be the thing. Osteosarcoma research saves lives. Full stop, end of story. I'm alive because of one reason. I participated in an experiment. This is not something that I say to make myself feel better or uh, you know, when I've been up writing a grant with, with like no sleep this week or when I've got patients in the office or when I've got partners that I'm trying to encourage. This is reality. This is my reality that I live with every day. Osteosarcoma's research saves lives. So we need to keep our foot on the gas. I'll admit it, sometimes you feel like Sisyphus uh, pushing the same rock up the same hill day after day. President Coolidge and, and also Dr. Jeannie Kleinerman had this advice for us, press on. This is gonna solve all the problems of the human race. I remember, um, uh, I, I was applying for a grant from, from another uh, sarcoma foundation, and uh, I was sure this was the year I was going to get it. And for the third year in a row, I didn't get it. So what do you do at a time like that but call your mom? So I called Dr. Kleinerman, unloading uh, my, my sadness on her, and she said, Kurt, I, I don't know what to tell you. You, you got to push on. This, this business requires a thick skin. Uh, if you believe in it and you love it, and I know you do, you will push on. And so that was eight years ago, and here I am. So I guess something's gone okay. This is another thing I've gotten very interested uh, with, and this has nothing to do with surgery. It's this idea of homeostasis. And Maeve and Ryan, you're going to learn all about this term in medical school. So homeostasis is basically your normal. Okay, your, your steady state, what your body is doing all the time to maintain a normal steady state. Well, fighting sarcoma is pretty straightforward. Uh, you put your head down and you do whatever you got to do to see the next day. And you repeat that for as many days as necessary. Uh, this is a very, very difficult thing because, you know, you get through your treatments and the doctors and the surgeons are all high-fiving each other um, because you're still alive. And they have, we have every reason to do that. That's, that's a reason to jump up and down and be happy. Um, but what do you do when you're putting the pieces of a life back together again that are no longer the same size or shape? How, how do you negotiate that? And I don't have a good answer for that. I, I, I know it when I see it because I see it in 100% of my young sarcoma patients. But besides being able to say, hey, I, I see what's happening here. And it's hard and, and everyone goes through this and I went through it and time is gonna help and you're gonna be okay. Besides saying that, I don't know what to do. So I hope as I get older and God willing a little bit wiser, I figure out better ways of shepherding people through the search for the no, new homeostasis in their lives. Uh, absolutely need to give a shout out to my lab. This is the musculoskeletal oncology lab. Uh, hardest working scientists in the business. We want to own metastatic osteosarcoma biology. We want to be the world's experts and we want to do it uh, the best. And the reason why we want to do it the best is for, for you and, and for everybody who's uh, you know, out there slugging away right now. And uh, that's, that's whom we serve in the lab. And this is uh, everyone who's in the lab. Uh, these are some of my funding sources. Uh, but boy, it was a great treat to be with all of you. But if I can answer any of your questions, I, I'll certainly give it a try. Thank you. Thank you. We, we might have a few questions for you. <laughs> and I, I, have, I have one ridiculous question to ask you, but it's a burning yeah. question. So I'm, I'm going to ask it. But I'm first going to say one of the greatest bits of medicine you can give an osteosarcoma patient is hope and for the three of us i'm gonna i'm gonna <laughs> gonna speak for the three of us 
to be in to be an osteosarcoma patient and to be in that bed and most of us did not know an osteosarcoma patient yeah. and when we heard of an osteosarcoma patient it was usually in the past tense yeah. this is this is common so to have you walk in the door and say i was where you are right now you almost don't even need to do anything else to to impart hope to that patient that's that's significant just to have somebody walk in and say i'm i'm going to take care of you and i i i actually know what you, what you're going through and there's hope you don't even need the words there's hope so that's brilliant can, can i can i speak to that real yes, fast please so do. I, I should have I, I should have said this beforehand, but I didn't. Um, uh, my my mom always said, if I could just like touch one person that has survived this, like now, that is, that's all I need. I just need to know that somebody has has done this. So I I think um, from for a, a parent's standpoint, that is very very helpful. Um, and when I'm when I'm having that that terrible talk, like that's the worst talk of your life, um, I I steal things from uh, Toronto and from my partners and from me. So what what I say is, um, you're having a terrible day, a terrible day. This might be your worst day, but but here's the thing: I had a terrible day too, and this will not be fun or easy. In fact, it will be neither, but we, we, we can get through this. And that's, that's the, that bit's mine. The part I steal from uh, Pete Ferguson in Toronto is um, you will forget just about everything we talk about today, and that's fine. There are three words you got to remember, treatable and curable. That's all you got to remember, which is treatable and curable. And from my uh, senior partner, Rich McGow, uh, he just looks the, the patient and the family in the eye and says, this is what I do. This is all I do. I'm going to help you. So yeah. some, you don't always have to be fancy. You just got to tell the truth. Yeah, please don't be fancy. That's, that's the thing. And we, we actually have a program based on this at, at, at MIB Agents, of which Ryan and Maeve are both certified in. It's called the Ambas it's, it's our ambassador agent program. And we train osteosarcoma survivors who are out of treatment for at least one year and they go through a certified peer visitor program and they become certified peer visitors wow. so that they can walk into a hospital room where there's an osteosarcoma patient and the osteosarcoma caregiver and they walk in and they really <laughs> you know i go back to they don't really need to say anything you just walk right. in the door and they bring gifts and MIB swag and oh. resources and all of these things. But it's superfluous because just that person walking in saying, I survived and I was where you are is such a big deal. And now as a, as a, as a mother, I think I would crumble on the floor in gratitude if somebody walked in and said that to me, if that were my child yeah. in the bed. So, so really, so, so brilliant. Okay. So my, so my burning ridiculous question yeah. that I have all the time, um, because I write this a lot. Why is orthopedic spelled differently when you're a surgeon and when you are writing about orthopedic? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Okay. So yeah, it's, um, so funny. So the the old A E spelling. Yes. That is uh, for uh, pretend. That is like for pretentious people like me. It's from old English. It's the way the Brits do it. So, uh, and you if you look at orthopedic departments uh, across the country, some do and some don't. The the uh, we do because maybe we're a little bit snooty here in Pittsburgh. But uh, you can do it both ways. They're both acceptable. Okay. Does that, is, is that answer your question? That answers my question. And I know okay. it's a ridiculous one. So we move on, Ryan. Ah. <laughs> yeah, so this question asks, uh, what advice do you have for an aspiring orthopedic oncologist? What a great question. Um, it's, it's a long haul. It's after high school, for me, it was 17 years of training. And uh, so, it, you know, 
my, my wife always says, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what gets you going and go do it. Because what the world needs is people that have found what gets them going. So it makes me insane when I'm talking to medical students and residents and I, I, want, I say, hey, Ryan, what do you, what do you want to do? What are you thinking about? And they'll say some nonsense like, well, we're going to need a lot of joint surgeons or, well, we're going to need a lot of neurologists or this. I don't care. I care about what excites you, what you're passionate about. Because if you do what you're passionate about, you're going to be great no matter what you do. So if orthopedic oncology is, is your jam and you've decided that that's what you can wake up doing every day, go do it. And that's the best advice I can give you. Yeah, no, that was very helpful. And just thank you so much. Your talk was so fun and I, I really loved it. But we also have a question from Carolyn. She's a 30-year-old Ewing sarcoma survivor who has had a 3D pelvic reconstruction surgery oh, wow. that has since been infected. Um, she's wondering how many patients with limb salvage implants get infections that then lead to amputation anyway, um, particularly focused on functionality at age 46 and is a teacher. For sure. Yeah. Um, hey, Carolyn, I'm 46 too. So I, <laughs> you got a sympathetic ear here. You believe me. Um, infection makes us all look silly. Um, and you know, if you think about it, what are the three things that keep infection away as a surgeon? Small incisions, not, not for you. Short operations, short in duration, like you know, a half hour, that was not you. And not putting any uh, uh, foreign devices in, that was not you either. So uh, almost no matter what we do, um, if we're putting in implants, we're behind the eight ball and infection is always a risk. I wish I could give you a specific number about what percentage of people like me, um, you know, had their surgery complicated by infection and subsequently went on to have an amputation. I, I don't know the number. The risk of infection for distal femur is around 10%. It's a little bit more than that for tibia. The proximal tibia is a rough area. Um, it's probably around there for pelvis also. Probably not all those patients go on to amputation, but if I had to guess, um, I, I would say it's hovering around five to 10%. Um, it's not an inconsequential number. It's certainly not inconsequential if you're the one with the infection. Um, but uh, yeah, in, infection is not a nut we have cracked and um, the, the, best, the best surgeons in the world, the best hands in the world, it, it, it happens to all of us. Um, uh, so yeah, I wish I could say more to help you, Carolyn. I hope that helps a little bit. I have a question just related to infection. You had spoke a lot about osteointegration. Yeah. I'm an amputee also, so I'm familiar with it. Yeah. I was wondering if that is possible for osteosarcoma patients while receiving chemo or if the infection risk is too high. Great question. So I personally would not, and, and here's why, because um, you are, uh, you know, adriamycin is doxorubicin, which is the A in MAP treatment, uh, is really, really, really hard on things that are trying to heal. I mean, that's ultimately, if you go back in time, that's probably why I lost my leg. Um, so if you want something to one, a piece of metal to grow to your bone, and, and number two, you want that area around the metal to heal without getting infected while you're taking chemo is probably not the best time to do it. I would probably not do it that way. I'm sure that somebody either here or uh, over in Europe or both has, has done it during treatment. I would not. I'm a, I'm a pretty cautious guy. Uh, so I have a follow-up question with that. Yeah. So it's, uh, it asks, what makes a patient a good candidate for osteointegration? Um, young, no comorbidities, meaning like not diabetic, not a smoker, um, and a long residual limb, meaning you, you got a lot of femur to work with, okay? Because let's, uh, again, it's, it's, you know, my job, Dr. Goodman, Dr. Healy, um, all, all these surgeons, we got to be the pessimist in the room and think, 
think about the next procedure. Okay, when this falls apart, what am I going to do? When this goes wrong, what am I going to do? So with that being in mind, somebody who has a lot of femur to work with is a great candidate because you know, let's say just you lose and the whole thing goes terribly and you need to go back to a more traditional socket design. Well, you need to have enough femur to support that. So that, that, is, a, that is a big part of it. Could you use the, sorry if I pronounced this wrong, Repiphysis implant prior to Stanmore's? And how would you improve upon Stanmore's? I, I uh, the Repiphysis is a little bit old for me. So this was um, also the, it was really the first attempt at a non-invasive expandable. So, um, you know, God bless them. I mean, they, they weren't great, but, you know, when you're trying to invent a new technology, you know, how, how often are you going to hit it out of the park on the first try? So uh, the Repiphysis uh, worked by uh, putting the patient like a wand over them, if memory serves, and the, the things that let the prosthesis expand were made of wax, and you would kind of like melt the wax, and it would expand the, uh, the, the rings inside to let them go like, choop, 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 and that's how they would expand. Um, I did not use that device um, because it um, was pretty much not being used too much by the time I was in fellowship and learning. Um, how would I improve on the Stanmore? So that, that's the name of the company that makes those uh, um, uh, expandable megaprostheses. What would I do to expand them, um, to improve them? It would be really nice to uh, have a, a small rotating hinge. That's an engineering problem. So the, uh, when, when the patient gets to a certain size, you can no longer do a rotating platform hinge, which is uh, kind of the way God made our knees to work. Our, our knees do this a little bit. Um, they are a fixed hinge, which puts a lot of stress on the bone and metal interface, especially in the presence of bone cement. So you know, on the other hand, when you pick up these Stanmores, it feels like a Mack truck. I mean, they are really sturdy implants and they're very satisfying to put in. But biomechanically, would I like the kids' implants to have a rotating platform? That would be cool. I don't even know if that's um, biomechanically possible because I'm not an engineer. Um, uh, Paul Unwin, who's, who's an engineer over there at the UK who saw this thing from the beginning, is a brilliant dude. And I got to believe that if there was a way to do it, um, Paul would have figured it out, but that remains on my wish list. Have you ever performed a tibial turnout procedure or a rotation plasty? Yeah, so there are, uh, there are a lot of guys and ladies, uh, including my junior partner, Dr. Stella Lee, who, who did her training at Harvard with Mark Gebhardt, who's done a bajillion uh, rotation plasties. I don't know anyone who does them better. Um, uh, I, I have tried, and, and mine uh, ended uh, not well. Uh, I ended up uh, uh, converting her to a transfemoral or above the knee amputation, uh, despite our best efforts. Um, uh, that I think it's a great, great, great operation. And they're durable, and you can beat the crap out of them. Um, I wish I were better at it than, than I am. I wish I had more practice at it than I do. I think they're great operations. I, um, uh, my, my comfort zone is putting in a uh, mega prosthesis. So if you got someone who's four or five, I, I think I would just uh, have my partner, Dr. Lee help me in, in all honesty. Um, anyone who's, who's getting closer to skeletal maturity, I'm probably putting in prosthesis because that's what I know. Evelyn Wilson, otherwise known as Katie's mom, who was in treatment at the same time I was in treatment. So Katie is, is dear to me always. Um, she uh, has something to say. Um, Dr. Kurt, we just want to say it's so amazing to see where you continue to shine in osteo. You're a huge reason why you encourage and give hope tomorrow, even when the outcome isn't what we want. Keep up your good work. We're forever grateful for all you did for Katie at Mount Sinai 10 years ago. We're so proud of all what you've done. Thank you so much, Kurt. We love you from Canada. Thanks, Evelyn. You made us all cry. <laughs> Here's me, love. Because of Katie. Yeah. I, I never knew about that connection that, that you had with 
with Kim's mom. Yeah. Yeah. The osteosarcoma community that we have is so brilliant. We're all connected. Um, we all learn from each other. We all cheer each other on. We go to funerals. We were inextricably connected. Yeah. And um, it's, it's joyful. It's beautiful. It's sorrowful. It's all of the things. And um, yeah. Katie. Yeah, so can, can I tell you about <laughs> can I tell you about yesterday in the office? Um, I I started out with getting pictures from uh, a, a young lady I operated on when she was uh, 15 years old, and now she has two babies, and I have my first osteosarcoma survivor babies, and I'm looking at these pictures, thinking this is going to be the best day ever, and then I just got my butt kicked the rest of the day. So you're right, it's a lot of highs and a lot of lows in this business. Oh yeah, I'll ask one. Uh, yeah. So, so as like I guess, uh, currently like I don't know exactly where I want to get into, or, like what specific like medical department. So I just wanted to ask, what was your I guess motivation or aspiration to get into like uh, I guess orthopedic oncology like specifically? So Ryan, the it's okay to have feelings like liking this or liking that, but I'd really caution you and may have also against um, going into med school, knowing that you're going to do X, Y, or Z. Okay. Mm -hmm. you, you really want to have an open mind because what if you think you want to do pathology, but you know, you do your neuro neurology rotation and it's just like the coolest thing ever. And, and your brain explodes and you're like, yes, this is it. Right. You don't want to be married to anything. So I, I did a bunch of rotations and I thought for the longest time that um, I was going to be a pediatrician, mostly out of expediency, right? Like orthopedic on orthopedic surgery residency is probably the most brutal, physically demanding exercise in all of medicine. I'm going to do that with one leg. That's not smart. Um, but I, I did my orthopedics rotation. And I said, well, you know, geez, I, I, I think this is what, I think this is what gets me going. I think this is what God made me to do. And then you do your orthopedic residency or your, your internal medicine residency or whatever you do. And then you do the, all, you know, in orthopedics, you do foot and ankle and spine and hand and joints and sports. And I did oncology and I said, well, I'm home. This, this is it. And you will know, Ryan and Maeve, you, you will know when you're home. So have, have the courage. If you think you know what you want to do, that is fine. But have the courage to say, I thought I loved this, but now I love this a little bit more, and that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. And you don't have to be an oncologist. I get it. <laughs> you, you, there's this thing, right? Um, you you, you want to give back, and you already do give back, and that's marvelous. But if neurology gets, I know I keep using neurology because I think it's cool, but if, if neurology or immunology or infectious diseases get you going do it somewhat off topic when i was pregnant with my first daughter i was really nervous about going into labor and and how how was i going to know this and and he said to me he said uh, labor is like love if you have to ask if you're in it you're not <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I, I always remember that with um, with fondness and it, it's so true it's such a true thing if you have to ask then probably not I I wondered about that too how do you stand for so long I think my my limb salvage surgery was like 16 hours how do you st yeah. I can't stand that long on, on limb salvage surgery yeah um yeah so you truly um the you're you're in the room and you're you're teaching and you're doing stuff and the adrenaline takes over and you don't notice um i'm i'm very fortunate um uh i uh i've had an amputation for over 20 years and no huge back problems i mean that that said i did have to have a <laughs> goodbye mrs wilson i love you um I did have to have a full revision of my amputation back in January, and that was a proper surgery. I was down for the count for a while. Um, but so far, I've been pretty fortunate. Um, if I had a brain in my head, I would have been a hand surgeon or not have done orthopedics at all. But 
you know, you got to do what you got to do. It's amazing. I, your, your presentation was so interesting. Those are parts of orthopedic surgery that I've never seen before, probably mercifully in <laughs> some cases, but, but really so fascinating to see and, and really appreciate your work so much, so much, so much. And, and, and that you undertake this work in spite of, of the pain and because of kids like Katie and, and the, the people that you treat. Yeah, thank you. If you haven't helped outrun osteosarcoma yet, please join or create a team. Thanks to BTG Specialty Pharmaceuticals for their sponsorship. You can outrun, outwalk, outcrawl osteosarcoma on your Peloton, out on the road, on a treadmill. It doesn't matter. Just do it. Go to mibagents.org forward slash outrunning. Is your mailbox dressed appropriately for September? If not, please put a bow on it. Go to mibagents.org forward slash bows and order a bow to support kids in treatment for osteosarcoma and to honor those who have passed from osteosarcoma. Bows make your mailbox look better and actually truly make it better for kids with osteosarcoma. Thanks for your support and thanks for listening today. See you next time.